Neighborhood College. I was going to say that this meeting will be recorded. So if you didn't hear that, I'm voicing it now. This meeting is going to be recorded just so we can have it for folks who are who miss a meeting or a session and we'll be able to send it to them. So um, thank you again for coming. I know we're going to have people trickling a little bit, but again, one of the things we talked about last time with a little housekeeping rule was valuing everyone's time. So starting on time, reminding folks, if you have the capacity, please turn your cameras on, being present and engaged. If you're not talking, I'm gonna ask you to mute. Um, again, enjoy a beverage, but try to hold off eating on camera, be mindful of background noise and distractions, you know, I'll try to avoid multitasking. We want you to be engaged, ask questions, focus your attention on the class, um, be considerate of everyone speaking, be, re pre be respectful of the presenters. Um, it's okay, we have disagreement, but personal attacks are not okay. Um, raise your hand and just raise your hand. If you need to raise your hand, click the raise your hand icon. And then you can also put your comments in the chat. Um, and to make to put your comments in the chat, you can click the chat button icon and use a jab down arrow to send a message to everyone or a specific person. So second session, but I do know that we have some participants who were not able to join us at the last session. Is there anyone who was not able to join us at the last session? I want to take the opportunity to have them introduce themselves if you are here. And if I wasn't you at the last session. Okay, so Mr. Oliver Stout, thank you for yeah. being here this evening. Could you introduce yourself? Tell us your name, what community you live in, and give us one word that describes your community. Uh, my name is Oliver, of course. Um, and I'm from the Mount Vernon community area and uh what i can say is that it's a uh, pretty diverse uh, one word to describe it um there's a lot of different ethnicities in that area great great so Oliver, I'm Latishma Walters. We have a couple colleagues on this um, call. I'm with Neighborhood and Community Services. I'm the regional manager for um, Region 1, which covers Mount Vernon District, hence this, and also the lead district. I have my colleagues on, um, also on the call. We have Katina Matthews, who's our community developer. We have Leon Milkins, who's a service area manager. Um, we also have Robert O'Quinn, who's our technology program manager. We have Paul Woods, one of our other community developers. We have Norma Lopez, who's my colleague and partner in crime. She's a regional manager in Region 2. We have Jennifer Henry Jones, my other partner in crime. Keisha Gill, um, regional manager. Um, I want to be sure we have Crystal Woodley on the line, who is the service area manager. We also have Tori Piper, who is the operations manager. And I'm trying to see Karen DeMehango, who is also the regional manager in region three. And I'm just double checking to see if I missed anyone, any of my colleagues. I don't think I have. All right, and we also have one of, um, Oh, established, yes. We also have Matt, Maddie from Supervisor Stork's office with us. So, hey, Maddie. Um, Hi. All right. Anyone else who's new? And I know we have some 8019 telephone number, and I think they were here last time, right, Katina? Because I remember, okay, so I just want to be sure. Well, with that, again, thank you. This is our second session um, of the Mount Vernon District Neighborhood College. Um, at the last, um, at our last week, Thursday, we asked you to tell us your name, what community you live in, and one word that describes you. So I'm going to ask Tori if you could put up, um, the word we did say that we're going to put all your words in um in a word cloud so i want you to see what it looks like so this is a word that this you guys 
talked about describing your community, you will have the opportunity to get this. And as we go through these sessions, I want you to think about, you know, the words that you use to describe your community. You talked about it being underserved, some said peaceful, artistic. But as we go through these sessions and we talk about civic engagement and what that means, I really want you to see where there's synergy, where there's opportunities to do some more engagement. And maybe at the end, we can talk a look at these words and see if you still feel aware about your community or if there's other ways we other words that we probably need to add so um uh, Oliver, you talked about your community being, being diverse. I think that was mentioned in here. So I think we'll put it again and see how it populates on this screen. So this is the word cloud. We'll have it for you at the end of our session and you'll also be able to have this for yours. I'm gonna ask, before I turn it over to Katina, as you know, with all technology, we have the best laid plans and sometimes our best laid plans um, don't work out the way we plan. So I'm going to ask that you grant grace if we have some technology challenges. We've done some testing. We did a run through. But like I said, with technology, it's never always perfect. So please just grant us some grace. Um, and with that, Katina, I am going to turn it over to you to kind of kick us off. All right. Thanks, Latishma. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to session number two. You all made it back. Um, and for those of you who are new, um, my name is Katina Matthews. I'm the community developer for Neighborhood and Community Services for the Mount Vernon um, District, as well as um, Lee District, which uh, serves pretty much on the left, the right, the top, the bottom, front, backwards side of Richmond Highway, which goes all the way to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, um, going uh, north and then and south all the way to uh, Lorton, and then also portions of our Springfield um, area as well. So uh, we're happy that you decided to join us again for session two. We have a packed um, agenda um, for tonight, and we are excited that we have two presenters as well as another opportunity uh, for some development and community engagement. Um, just wanted to make mention that uh, if you have not already filled out your practicum sign-in sheet, sign-up sheet, please make sure you do that. I will send that out again. It is a fillable form, so if you have a, a, if you have a, a PDF uh, Acrobat or if you have Word, I will send it out in both versions just in case if you um, are not able to use one a platform, uh, but it is fillable, so when you open it up, it'll allow you to type your uh, information in and then just save it. Once you save it on your device, then you can email it back to me. If you have any technical difficulty, just let me know and then I can... Um, I can uh, help you out uh, and fill that form out. Uh, we just want to ensure that we keep this uh, the form in a consistent manner um, because this is not only um, our neighborhood college, um, but we do this countywide. So we want to continue to use the existing uh, forms and and uh, platforms that we're using uh, currently. Um, so just fill that out if you can. Again, if you have any issues, just let me know and I will uh, assist you. Some of you already have reached out, um, and um, hopefully you you were able to get in Zoom. Um, uh, with a little bit more ease tonight, uh, like Latishma said, um, you know, this is uh, still, if you know, we've been in this pandemic for two years. A lot of these things are new um, in regards to how we are operating. So we just want to make sure that um, you do grant us grace, but also at the same time, um, if you have any issues, please feel free to reach out and we can um, try to connect and try to help you out the best way that we can. We want to ensure that you are able to see the slides um, while, we, while they're on the screen with the presenters. But uh, you will get copies. Um, and if you're not able to print out the copies, do not worry. I will have uh, all of them for you at the end of our neighborhood college. Um, and if you need something specific as, a re as it uh, relates to your practicum, then, then just let me know and I'll make sure you'll get it before the end of, uh, end of the neighborhood college uh, if you need it to support your practicum. But again, if you have not already filled out the practicum sign-up sheet, make, please make sure you do that. Uh, I would like to try to have most of them in by tomorrow. I have a, a good amount already, but I know there's a, a few of you still uh, contemplating um, about what to do. And at the end, uh, close to the end of this session tonight, uh, my colleague Jennifer Henry Jones will be also um, presenting or being able to be used as a, a technical assistant staff uh, that will be able to open up the floor and you can ask some questions as well as um, get any feedback from, you know, from your peers here on the call, especially for those who are uh, going together uh, to, to do the practicum as a group, because we are encouraging if you can do it as a group, that would be great, okay? All right, next slide, Tori. 
So again, tonight we have a, a jam-packed agen agenda. We're gonna have a Fairfax County overview of the county-wide strategic plan. Lori Epp will be presenting first, and then we'll have a presentation of the Fairfax County budget and overview by Phil Hagan. After that, we'll have uh, an, another opportunity for uh, to learn about community engagement um, and leadership development uh, uh, through an exercise or through a presentation called asset mapping, which is which is really cool. Um, and then again, we're going to have a practicum check in where you can ask questions and and uh, get any feedback and, and also be able to try to connect with your peers if if, uh, if possible. And we'll have some opportunities, um, at, I think, at the next class or the, the next class after that. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to do some breakout groups and so we can all um, you know, share and um, support each other with the practicum check-in as well. All right, so uh, again, if you have any questions or anything in the chat, please make sure you just put it in there. We'll try to get to it as quick as possible. Uh, but to kick us off, um, go ahead and give it to uh, Lori Epp, uh, who will start us off with the Fairfax County Wide Strategic Plan. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, so I see yes. some nods. Um, we can go to the next slide. Please, we'll start there. All right, great. Um, so thank you for having me tonight. Um, my name is Laureate and I'm the countywide strategic plan uh, communications manager. And the purpose of the presentation tonight is to provide you with just a general overview of the plan, the plan rather. Um, we briefly explain the background, maybe share an updated timeline and let you know we're headed now that we're in the implementation phase. Um, I, I'm a pretty fast talker. So there'll be plenty of time, I think at the end for any questions or comments that you guys might have tonight. All right, next slide, please. So um, the strategic plan is coordinated internally through the Department of Management and Budget with, with um, both Phil and I are part of. Um, so we collaborate closely with every other department throughout the county, as well as the county executive's office. And that's especially important as the work we, um, as the work we, we do with the, the One Fairfax team as well, um, which is the work that all of us are collectively undertaking to advance the county's uh, policy on racial and social equity. Um, and the strategic plan really plays like a key role in operationalizing the work that is happening through that policy as well. Um, for context, we developed a plan mostly in 2019 uh, through the work of nine employee teams, which were supported by the deputy county executive uh, champions, uh, as we call them. Um, and the first proposed plan was presented to the board of supervisors by the county executive in early 2020. Um, and then of course, as we all know, um, COVID hit. So the decision was made to really kind of pause the public process, um, but we spent the time really updating the plan to reflect the immediate impacts of COVID as well as the current community conditions and to make sure it reflects people's day-to-day -day, uh, living experiences that really changed as a result of it. So we also uh, intentionally sought out additional community feedback um, and had meetings with members of the board individually to uh, seek their continued input on the proposed plan and make sure we incorporated everything as we went through. Uh, the strategic plan was really de designed to be high level and long range enough to be able to stay relevant over time. Um, we weren't really we were really expecting to test it um, that quickly, uh, like from a pandemic, but we were really very happy to see that the majority of the plan um, really held its rele relevance rather, um, and really its value too, even throughout the, um, the un really unprecedented community conditions that were happening as a result of it. So we also uh, worked to crosswalk and align elements of the proposed plan with other countywide initiatives that continue to emerge, um, which you may be familiar with the uh, Chairman's Task Force on Equity and Opportunity, um, as well as the, the COVID Economic Recovery Framework as well. Um, and these initiatives uh, also generated additional community input from new sources, and it really reinforced the work that had been completed at the plan starting in 2019, um, as well as really, really offering some additional data and insights. Um, the strategic plan was ultimately adopted by the Board of Supervisors this past October, so in 2022. Um, and we'll make sure to provide, you know, really multiple links. Um, before I leave, I'll put some links to the plan and our webpage and some other stuff in the chat so that you have access to it after I'm done. Uh, next slide, please. The goals. Um, so one of the things that surprises a lot of people is that this is actually the first real comprehensive strategic plan that Fairfax County has ever adopted. 
Uh, there were multiple reasons why the county executive and the board of supervisors really saw um, a lot of value in pursuing this work. Uh, I'd say first, um, it gives us a chance to articulate and truly agree on a long-term vision for the county that we can pursue over the next 10, like 20, 30 years and beyond. Uh, second, it allows us to integrate and align all the work that's happening consistently through the county at, um, at really a high level. And now that's not to say that the strategic plan would ever replace any of the issues um, or any of the department specific plans that we need to do in our day to day work. It's really just to move us to a place where we better where we're better coordinated and most importantly, getting ourselves out of department silos and having a better sense of what we're doing countywide, as opposed to what we're doing really like department department or program by program. So in terms of the focus of the plan, um, as I mentioned, there's a long-term vision, which is kind of like the North Star that we're moving towards. But we see the plan as a way to be able to focus and priority, prioritize county initiatives over the next three to five years as well. Uh, we want to be able to use the data and frame issues uh, in such a way that the board can really use those to make some uh, near-term decisions as well. Uh, then finally, progress, uh, making sure that we're doing a better job of communicating to the residents um, of Fairfax County in a way that's um, simple and accessible. We want everybody to really understand and, and use the information. Uh, the progress that we're making um, relative to the goals that we've set, um, we're making pretty good progress there. And also that uh, we're, we're trying to be really transparent. So we're trying to be transparent around the ways um, on what the work that we still have to do and where we're going. And again, as I said, we really want to make that available to everybody that lives in Fairfax um, at a level that people understand. Next slide. So also we followed our four main guiding principles that guided the plans uh, development. The first was to apply a racial and social equity lens to um, engagement efforts and strategy development. Um, while the county is really a great place to be, we recognize that inequities and disparities uh, in outcomes uh, continue to exist. Um, and for this reason, it was important to link the strategic plan to one Fairfax, which, as I said previously, is the county's commitment to considering equity in everything we do um, and really acting to ensure that everybody has equitable access to all the opportunities, um, no matter who they are or really where they live in the county. The second was inclusive engagement. Um, we're really looking to create multiple avenues for the community, stakeholders, uh, employee engagement. We recognize that um, the need to create multiple inclusive opportunities for everyone to provide uh, input and feedback on the plan, uh, especially people who may not normally uh, participate in this type of public process. Um, and that we really need to be uh, much more intentional about making these genuine connections with people um, that can extend over the long term. Uh, the third was community outcomes, um, really defining community, um, defining community focused outcomes and strategies versus uh, using the uh, government centric ones. Um, and finally, data driven. So we're really looking to use uh, David, uh, data driven insights and develop an evidence based strategies. Um, we really see a chance to improve the way we collect and use data countywide um, and specifically how we use it to make important county decisions um, and how the results of our efforts are really shared within the community as well. Next slide. Thank you. So this slide. Um, it, it provides just like a snapshot of the community engagement that was used as we went about the development of the plan. Um, we definitely had a strong desire and responsibility to ensure that the countywide strategic plan truly reflects the voice of the community. Um, we're really focusing on achieving the outcomes that really mattered most to those that we serve. Uh, throughout the process, we really tried to reach out, as I said, to the people and places who might have um, historically been more underrepresented or um, in a post strategic planning process. Uh, we think that we really exceeded our past efforts in this um, and these types of initiatives in county government. But of course, uh, one of the goals of the plan is to continue to find better ways to listen to people, both through really official channels uh, when we're talking about getting feedback for the strategic plan, uh, but also in many ways that the, um, the county community is already talking to us about issues that matter to them. Um, and that's especially important too. Uh, we find that we get better feedback when we're going to where people are at as well, because we do know that the strategic plan uh, may be exciting sometimes for us, but not as exciting for others. So we tend to have better luck when folks have a specific interest in something and are already there. Um, and we're, we're really constantly looking for ways that we can um, translate information and use what we might consider like non-traditional outlets to connect with folks. Um, 
that's something that's really been a huge priority through the development of the plan and looking ahead um, as we're going through implementation that we know that's gonna be equally as important as we continue to go forward. Slide please. So this is a really short video that provides an overview of the 10 community outcome areas that I mentioned. Um, these outcome areas were developed uh, based on community feedback and we can talk in a few minutes um, a little bit more specifically about each. Um, I do wanna note that we now have this video available in um, Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Urdu, Farsi, and just recently added is Korean. So we, uh, we're we really trying to do a good job of showing people what we want to do instead of continually telling people want to do. Um, and something that we know is just because we translate it doesn't mean that everybody has that information. So we're trying to translate it and then uh, push it out to the communities who may need this information. Back to play. Through the 10 outcome areas that were developed based on community input, our first ever Fairfax Countywide Strategic Plan charts an exciting path towards our shared future as we work together with one Fairfax to preserve our existing quality of life while promoting equitable access to opportunity for all. Cultural and Recreational Opportunities a future where all people are aware of and able to participate in quality arts, sports, recreation, and culturally enriching activities. Economic opportunity, a future where all people, businesses, and places are thriving economically. Effective and efficient government, a future where all people trust that their government responsibly manages resources, is responsive to their needs, provides exceptional services, and equitably represents them. Empowerment and support for residents facing vulnerability. A future where all residents facing vulnerability are empowered and supported to live independent lives to their fullest potential. Environment. A future where all people live in a healthy, sustainable environment. Health a future where all people can attain their highest level of health and well-being. Housing and neighborhood livability, a future where all people live in communities that foster safe, enjoyable, and affordable living experiences. Lifelong education and learning, a future where all people at every stage of life are taking advantage of inclusive, responsive, and accessible learning opportunities that enable them to grow, prosper, and thrive. Mobility and transportation, a future where all people, businesses, and goods can move efficiently, affordably, and safely throughout the county and beyond via our well-designed and maintained network of roads, sidewalks, trails, and transit options. Safety and security, a future where all people feel safe at home, school, work, and in the community. Please follow our progress and find additional ways to share your thoughts and ideas at fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash strategic plan. Um, thank you. So at the end of my part, as I said, before I jump off, I will put the links to um, our site, to the plan and to the video. Um, the video is actually on our site and please, by all means, you're welcome to use it, share it. Um, and moving forward, um, we expect that we'll have more videos in the future where we can really show folks what we're expecting in the community. Okay, um, so on this slide, um, our, our community outcome areas. Um, 
as you saw and heard, we have 10. So we have 10 community outcome areas that were adopted by the Board of Supervisors in, in October. Uh, the main difference between the proposed plan and then the adopted plan is that we're previously nine areas. Um, after collecting community feedback and based on data, the decision was made to really separate out environment and health so that an appropriate focus was to be able to um, be placed on each of those areas. Okay, next slide. You'll see the vision statements that provide the foundation for the countywide strategic plan, rather, um, for each of the 10 areas. Uh, as we progress into the plan of implementation, uh, we've, we've actually identified two of the areas that are going to sort of serve as our starter areas. So we're going to pilot with these. Um, number one is economic opportunity. So we felt that this one really, um, really relates very closely and importantly to a lot of the other uh, community outcome areas. So we're really looking to integrate some work that's taken place around the COVID uh, economic recovery framework to really continue to move some of these strategies moving forward as well. Um, the second is effective and efficient government. So this outcome area relates to the way um, that we serve the community. Like how do we do it? How well do we do it? Um, how are we focusing on improving the way we serve people over time? Um, so we felt that um, internally to the county, um, focusing on this area would be really important, even as we look to continue the work that's taken place across all the other eight. Um, I don't think that we're waiting for a countywide strategic plan. Um, we weren't really necessarily waiting for one. Um, so there's a lot of work related to each of these that is actually going on and going to continue to move forward. Um, and then after we work on piloting these first two, the idea is to roll it out to the next eight. Um, we don't have a necessary specific time frame for those quite yet, uh, but but we are progressing and moving forward. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so it's a quick summary. Um, as I mentioned, all the documents are posted online. So if you're interested, there's a lot of background information, um, some context setting information if you want more detail than I provided tonight. So in early, um, I believe it was 2021, we developed a public information video to really like re-engage and update community members on the plan's goals, uh, the background timeline and process. And some of you may have seen that, um, but we actually just recently updated that as well to reflect um, any of the new work that's being done. So feel free if you've seen it to check it out. If you haven't seen it and you want some more information, please do so. Um, and in every possible way, I do want to note, we are doing everything we can to translate the information the information we have and that we're sharing um, in at least the top uh, languages that are spoken, spoken within the county as well. We're really looking for every opportunity to take what we are doing to inform and educate um, and really meet people where they're at. Um, and also, as I mentioned, we're really trying to focus on communicating in a way that isn't really like a overly bureaucratic and accessible to, the, and is accessible rather, to a lot of the, the people in the community. Um, our goal ultimately is to include as many people in the work of the strategic plan and really hear as many voices um, both now and in the future. And so we're excited to have opportunities like this where we can come and speak to um, our teams within the community uh, or our team members that work with the, with the county, but also the folks within the community who have an interest in what we're doing. And then the next in from next slide is really just my information. Um, I'm happy to take questions and comments today, but by all means, um, myself and my colleague Amy Brooks are um, here and ready to answer um, any questions or, or field any comments you may have. That is what we're doing, and that's that's why we're here. We're happy to do so at any time. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate your presentation. Um, like Lori said, we want to open it up for any questions. Um, if you do have a question, you can feel free to put it in the chat, or if you uh, want to raise your hand, um, or if you want to uh, take yourself off mute and you can ask uh, Lori a question regarding our strategic plan, please feel free to do so uh, at this time. Nova, I see Lori, quick question. In your opinion, how well um, does the county work together across the different areas? You know, I think that um, we talked about that before. So we're really using the strategic plan as a way where we can um, continue to break down some silos and, and work together um, and maybe um, a better way than we have in the past. I think that we uh, are working towards doing a good job and doing a good job in some areas, but I, I can't say that there isn't room for improvement. There's always room for improvement and that's what we're really looking to do. We're trying to find some unified, um, themes and, and goals and look for best practices. 
And that's actually what we're doing with kicking off these first two um, the community outcome areas as well. So as we're getting together, we're look, using this as an opportunity to bring everybody to the, to the table and really identify those best practices and get more people aware of what's going on and working together. Um, so I think that folks are doing well with it, but um, as I said, there's always room for improvement. So we're gonna continue to work at that. Okay, and um, Mr. Langford has his hand up. Yes, Lori, uh, I noticed in your um, a briefing, you talked about one of the one of the one of the key goals is safety. And uh, as as I understand how you defined it is pretty much how people the people feel safe in the community and that kind of thing. My question has to do with um, is there better does that also suppose include having access to policing, lead, legal, and judicial, judicial services? To me, what you had outlined there did not cover having access to police services, legal services, and judicial services within the, within the county. Is that uh, in, is that supposed to be included in that area or am I off target here? So um, my say my answer to that would, would, is, would be that we have it. And I think the summary that I gave you is just a brief summary. But what I did not touch on is um, our sample. We have strategies and metrics and um, we have metrics. We have, I think it's 228 metrics and 158 strategies. So within those strategies and metrics, um, proposed strategies and sample metrics, so they are subject to change. But I think what I can say is that we would be addressing access within these strategies and metrics. Um, what we're doing is as we're getting to each of these outcome areas, um, or rather, yes, each of the, the community outcome areas, we're gathering those experts in that, um, in that field. So perhaps like with safety and security, we're getting folks who have that knowledge as well as um, you know, background information to be able to give us some more of this information and to say, yes, you've covered everything. Yes, especially like access to services. So I would say, correct. That's definitely something we're looking at. Um, I didn't necessarily go into the specifics of it with this presentation, um, but that would be something that would be uh, better defined in the um, in the strategies and, and the metrics area. And I can always post some information on how to find those. So it touches a little bit more specifically on what you're asking too. I'll put that in the chat so you can read those. L Lori, if I can follow up, uh, sure. can I, can I uh, follow with you uh, on this particular topic? I'm offline to be able to, um, to have a call or a chat, whatever you like, meet in person. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, and let me let me just get your name real quick. Can if you could do me a favor and just are you able to type your name in there or just say hey, you know, follow up yeah. with me and I'll I'll shoot you my email too. So that okay, would be all right. Yeah, I can do that. Great. Thank you. Already starting to get the connection. See, that's wonderful. That's what is the purpose. That is right? why we're here. <laughs> and we like hearing from the community. Like we said, I think it's a good opportunity for us to go where people um, meetings like this is where people are actually interested in what is going on. Uh, so we're actually getting um, good, you know, good information and, and excited to talk to people who want to know more. Absolutely. Um, there's another question. Um, Kathy is asking, under the lifelong education and learning area, does this include Fairfax County Public Schools? Can you speak to what these partnerships look like? Education learning area, does this include so um, with the lifelong education and learning area and this particular strategic plan, um, it really talks more about what is going on beyond the school systems because the school system does have um, their own strategic plan as well. We're really looking at those relationships um, beyond. So it would be about with um, childcare, with about um, access for seniors. Uh, so some um, and language access. So while We've taken input from everybody on the plan. We really tried to touch on what may not be covered in the school system side of the house, if that makes sense. Oh, and thank you very much for putting my information right there. By all means, I will 
I'm happy to take emails or set up meetings with anybody who'd like. Thank you, Lori. Are there any other questions? Um, if, does anyone else want to ask anything else? Okay, Oliver. I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, I was wanted to ask, how do you guys plan on um, tapping into these uh, basically unheard voices who are pretty much oblivious to what's going on in the area? Uh, these are in certain areas, maybe like in low income areas or, you know, where there's the minorities. How do you guys plan on getting them engaged? Yeah, so the plan has already been developed and we've, um, I think we did, made some good efforts with that in getting the plan completed. But as we're moving forward, what we're trying to do is work with um, our internal folks and partners as well to be able to reach out to those communities. So um, I'm definitely on a, what is the name of it? The um, Community Engagement Partnership. There's a new group formed within the county that is um, the countywide to be able to get those folks who are in the community um, and being able to, essentially the communicators with the county are all in this group as well as partners and other stakeholders. And we're sharing information as much as possible so that we can get those folks who are in the community doing the work every day, um, you know, those folks that are, you know, pound the pavement, um, information in hand to be able to uh, bring that to folks. Um, and we know that not everybody has access to perhaps internet or, um, you know, other services uh, that, that we may be able to provide. So I think we're just um, trying to go for the folks, go to the folks who know best and to ask them for information. Um, we're trying to also make sure that we have the information available in alternative languages so that when we go to some of these folks, we can actually have a, uh, a solid conversation and be able to at least provide a little bit to them to start those conversations. Um, I can't say that we're doing everything um, perfectly at all because we know that there's more to be done. We keep looking at um, surveys right now. We're collecting surveys to make sure that we're um, using information in those conversations that are already happening. But again, I also know surveys aren't the best. Um, they're, they're not the end-all be-all of getting information from folks as well. So I think what we're really doing is relying on those folks who are, who are pound the pavement going in, the communicators of the area to tell us, A, what else do they need from us to be able to bring to the communities? And then also trying to um, team up with them to be present at those conversations and at the table so we can get in where it makes sense. Thank you, Oliver, for that question. Uh, Tree, do you have your hand up? Yes, I do. Um, Lori, I wanted to ask, um, I found out about this, these classes because I like to do a lot of research online and I have the time now. And But uh, I would like to participate more in the community. I volunteer, but I don't belong to different groups. So... Um, and the people who I volunteer to drive to their medical appointments are seniors. Uh, they talk, you know, because they have somebody to talk to when I'm taking them to their appointment and back home. Um, how do our voices get heard? Because if I wasn't searching on the internet, I would have had no clue about these classes. And um, the singers are glad that I told the ones that I have driven that I've uh, taken the classes and I will share the information with them. But um, it's like a certain segments are like, I feel um, now I'm not saying, I'm not speaking for everybody. I'm just speaking for me. Like lost, you're just here in Fairfax County and I live in Mount Vernon. You're just here, but things happen and you're not a part, you're not asked. And I just feel like, you know, I'm just living here, which is great, I love, Fairfax County, you know, I'm glad I'm living in Fairfax County. Um, so, uh, but if you want to become involved and you're not part of groups, how do you get your voice heard? Or is it best to join a group? So I'd say that's, that's a tough question and that, that's a hard one. Um, we're trying to get into the community as much as possible. I think opportunities like this are great, but you're exactly right, is sometimes there's folks who are not connected and sometimes finding the information when you're not connected can be very challenging. Um, 
what we had previously done, um, even when we were developing the plan, was reach out to, like I said, where folks were. So perhaps using um, places of worship. So we reached out to uh, communities, uh, like the faith-based community, because um, that was a good help in trying to get the information out there. Um, but that is that is the million dollar question. How do we get more folks' voices heard um, who may not be you know, connected to everything? And so um, we do rely heavily on NCS, everybody who is here at the table, because these are the folks that are really in those communities, some of those harder to serve communities as well, um, um, to be able to get the information out. And so if there's some folks with NCS that may want to weigh in on, on the question as well, that might be helpful too. But but I hear you. I hear that what you're saying is there's all these folks who want to know about the this information, you know, the information and services that are there, but um it, unless they're connected, just may not know. And that, that is a hard question to answer. Yeah. Um I was gonna would you let me to jump in, Lori? Yeah, please. I think okay. You rely so, heavily on NCS to help us. With it, so. <laughs> no, I, I totally hear the question. So I heard Oliver's question and I actually was writing writing it down. And then also um the question that was just asked. And one of the things we're gonna be learning about next week um is about the community the inclusive community-wide engagement, but the strategies of how do we um engage marginalized communities and what does engagement actually look like because it's not the same for every and everyone there's there's different ways that we connect with folks how are we informing how are we educating how are we are providing opportunities for input what does input look like for certain folks who don't have certain technologies um, I would definitely say that one of the things that you can definitely do is definitely count um, calling your supervisor's office if you want to get involved with faith-based communities, neighborhood and community services, because as part of Fairfax County, the one thing I think we have is the resources and someone knows someone, right? And that's the way we get connected. And who do we connect folks with? And what does that connection look like within communities? So we're really looking at how we engage um, underserved, because that's one of the words that came out, underserved communities, uh, marginalized communities, folks that don't speak the same language, you know, I'm not just speaking, I'm not just saying Spanish speaking, but Muslims and different stuff. So we'll hear more about that. But um, I will, you know, you have our information, definitely ways to get engaged. Definitely, please reach out to myself. You have Lori, but you can also reach out to Katina. So I'll put my information in the chat. I mean, you'll have my information, but I'll put it in the chat. And we can talk about some strategies because one of the things is we always talk about community voice and we, pro we need to find ways to hear about community voice. And, you know, we may think we're doing it right. And one of the things we know is, you know, we're not the, we don't know it all. So how are we open to sharing that information and receiving that information in a way that everyone can understand? So thank you for that. And like I said, we'll be learning more next week and I'll definitely be reaching out to you as we continue these conversations. Thank you. And I would like to just make a recommendation when uh, Fairfax County is asking for the car tax and property taxes and, um, um, the emergency services, if you want to sign up for emergency service to be notified, that's a good way to put information in those mm. envelopes. Oh, here, see? Strategies. I appreciate it. Thank you. I wrote it down. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. Thank yeah. you very much. Yep. And, and that's one of the reasons why we have these uh, neighborhood yep. colleges also is so mm -hmm. that way you can learn, but also be able to share Correct, um, and, and be able to get the information needed to, to make our communities even stronger, especially uh, we all have different interests, skills and competencies. Mm -hmm. So if we share them together and, and uh, they said four hours are better than two. Um, and so as many mouths and voices that we can have to, to lift up uh, our issues and concerns, uh, the better off I think that our communities will be. So thank you all for sharing uh, that information. Um, before we move on, if you, if you have any other further questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and, and Lori would definitely get back with you again. And, and if you do put it in the chat, we are taking notes and this session is recorded. We could definitely follow up and make sure the information gets passed on to the appropriate person. So uh, thank you, Lori. We appreciate your time and your presentations as always for coming and letting us know um, uh, about the great work that the, uh, what's going to be going, uh, being happening, what's going on in regards to the countywide strategic plan. So thank you for sharing tonight.
Yep. Thank you for having me. Have a good rest of the night. All right. You too. All right. Great conversation. Great discussion. I want to be able to keep us moving along. So our next presenter um, is Phil. Phil Hagen, are you uh, on? Yes, I'm here. With us? Okay. All right. Because I can't see everyone's face. So I want to make sure that you're still with us. So with that being said, uh, Phil is going to give us an, an overview of the countywide uh, budget. Um, and we're going to go ahead and uh, kick that off right now. So Phil, take it away. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, run through first some slides talking about um, just the, uh, the overall uh, basics of the budget, how our budget process works, um, and then um, get into what we've been talking about through this current budget season, uh, looking ahead towards the FY23 budget. Um, I will just note that we are in kind of a, a odd, um, say, week and a half or two week period right now because uh, the, the way that our budget process works is every year the county executive proposes his budget, which is what we get out to the community in January. Uh, we then go through our, our community engagement process. We have public hearings, um, and then the board marks up or makes changes to the budget, which they actually just did two days ago on Tuesday. Um, and then we have uh, usually a week or two to incorporate those changes before the board actually formally adopts. And so we're in that kind of weird period where the board has now indicated what changes they're going to be making to the board, but they haven't formally adopted. Um, and so as we look through these numbers, these the, the numbers that I'll have later in the presentation still reflect the county executive's proposed budget, uh, but I'll talk through the changes that the board has signaled that they are going to be making to the, to the budget, which include um, some tax relief, some additional funding for affordable housing, um, some additional funding for um, our parks program as well. Um, so if we can move to the, the next slide. Um, so, you know, overall the budget, um, I, I really think the, the budget is, is possibly the, the most important decision that our elected officials make each year, because it really does um, strike that balance between the revenue that the county is gonna raise through the combination of taxes, fees, charges for services, um, versus the funding that we're going to use to support county services, to try to advance um, those priorities of the, of the, the community, uh, especially those that are, are now being identified as part of the, str the strategic plan. Um, and, and really striking that balance of, of how much funding we're gonna raise, but then also how we're going to use it. Um, our fiscal year, it starts on July 1st, it runs through June 30th. Um, and then uh, by law, um, this is something that's important to note, the county must have a balanced budget. Um, I know the, the budget we hear most about is the federal budget and uh, for the federal government, they're able to balance their operating budget against time. They're able to say, we're gonna borrow money in order to pay current salaries and we'll pay for it later. Um, we as a county by law can't do that. We, um, we can borrow money only to do capital projects in order to, to build buildings, to build facilities, to uh, make improvements that have a lasting value. In order to maintain our operations, in order to pay our employees, we must do it with the current uh, funding that we're, we're raising. Um, as I mentioned before, the county executive proposes the budget each year in uh, January or February. Um, and then we go through a, um, our, our process and it has to be the board that actually takes action and votes to approve it, um, which typically happens in uh, the beginning to uh, mid-May. Um, and then also we, we do have a legal requirement that any adjustments to our budget throughout the year that exceed 1% require a public hearing that's advertised and then held prior to the board making those changes. So if we move to the next slide, um, so the, the county's basic financial structure is uh, fairly complex, actually, in that we have a lot going on in our budget. Um, and this, uh, this chart here is, is trying to lay out the, the basics of how we've, we've structured the budget. Um, when we talk about the budget each year, we typically focus on just those boxes all the way off on the left margin, the general fund. Um, the general fund is, it gets the most attention because that is where the board has the most flexibility as far as um, what they are spending funding on. The general fund is where real estate taxes, um, personal property taxes, uh, sales taxes, that funding tends to go. Um, the board has, has pretty unrestricted authority as to what they do with each additional dollar we get there. Uh, the general fund is where you'll see a lot of the, uh, the things that you think of as core uh, government services. Uh, police, fire, um, neighborhood and community services, my own department, all reside and get their funding uh, from the general fund. Um, going outside the general fund, 
we get into a number of other funds that um, typically are for purposes that are long lasting, uh, like our debt service funds um, are there to repay the, uh, the bonds that we've taken out in order to work on capital projects. We have our capital project funds, which are um, resources that we've identified in order to make improvements to our facilities, like our police stations, fire station, parks, um, and so those projects we, we expect to last for multiple years. And so when we identify funding for that, we want it to stay within that fund in order to fund those projects as we go forward. Uh, we have special revenue funds. Um, typically a special revenue fund is one where there is a revenue source that's intended for a specific purpose. Um, one example would be we, um, we have a community center in Reston as well as one in McLean that are supported by local taxes in those areas. And so those funds should support those community centers only. And so we've segregated those revenues. Another example would be our solid waste system, uh, both our, our collection as well as our operation of the, the, um, the Asheville. Um, again, the, the funding that's raised by those programs is intended to support those programs. Uh, we have internal funds, which um, like our uh, county insurance and, and health benefits funds that are really serving um, internal county agencies, and then we have um, enterprise funds, which are, are really just our sewer system. Um, those are really operated like a business where the revenue that we raise from the sewer rates are intended to support that system as well as the uh, capital improvements to that system, replacing the sewer lines over time, replacing um, uh, or, or um, making uh, repairs and, and upgrades to the Noman Cole Center and others. Uh, and then we have our, our trust funds, um, which are again, long lasting. Um, these are funds where we're really trying to accumulate assets in order to pay for some of those long lived uh, employee benefits like our retirement systems our, and our um, retiree health funds. Um, so if we move to the next slide, then um, talking about scale of all this, um, the general fund, that part that, we that I said we focus on is really that, that gray circle and then the light blue circle as well. Um, our total fund, when we look at everything that was on that past picture is that, that big dark blue circle. All told, our total budget is upwards of $9 billion, actually approaching $10 billion. And that is when we include, um, you know, again, the, uh, the solid waste system, the sewer system, um, all of those funds. Um, then again, when we narrow down to the area, the general fund, where the county has, uh, sorry, the, the Board of Supervisors has um, kind of broad flexibility as far as what they're spending those funds in. Um, the general fund budget is about $4.8 billion right now. Um, and then when we narrow down to that gray circle, um, that's narrowing down to just the funding we're spending directly out of the general fund um, because we do transfer funds out of the general fund to support a number of those other funds like our community services board. So let's move on then, slide. So our budget process, um, every year as we're developing the next year's budget, um, we, we start off with the existing budget as our baseline. We do look each year to see what kind of efficiencies uh, there might be, um, what kind of savings we might be able to generate in order to reduce that baseline, but that is our starting point. Um, we do then look from there, and um, one of the, the largest priorities, and as you'll see, more than half of our budget goes to, to the public schools. Uh, we do take a look at what the public schools' needs are. Um, both uh, what they've requested for their operating budget to actually run the schools, um, what we need in order to fund their debt service requirements on the bonds that we've issued for um, their uh, construction and renovation of schools, and also uh, looking at what they need in order to sustain their capital program. Um, we then also, you know, you think about the next layer of what we really need to meet, and that would be our contractual and legal obligations, um, especially meeting our own debt service. Um, as well as uh, meeting the cost of um, employee benefits for one. Um, we also then, uh, a lot of what drives our budget decisions are guidance from the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the Board of Supervisors, as your elected representatives, um, are you know, trying to, to gauge what the, the needs are of the community. And um, every year they give my department budget guidance of, of what they would like to see in the budget the next year identifying those top priorities that they would really like to see progress being made on. Um, and those certainly are, are then one of our, our, our top among our priorities as far as getting those into the budget. Um, 
and then also we are um, you know, looking at other emerging issues that come up. Um, we, we hear from the, the departments across the county as far as you know, the challenges that they're face, facing, what they're seeing in the community, um, what sort of um, you know, new situations are developing since the last budget cycle. And so really, as we're building the budget, we're trying to balance all of those priorities within a package that is um, affordable as well, um, trying to take into account the, the impact on taxpayers as we're putting this together. Um, as we're developing our, our budget each year, uh, on the next slide, um, we're, we're always operating in two different fiscal years because we always have the, the current budget where departments are, are currently spending money, we're currently receiving tax revenues, and then we're also trying to, to build the budget for the following year. And so this is our calendar that lays that out where we have our current fiscal year on the left-hand side and the future fiscal year that we're developing on the right-hand side. Um, Within the current fiscal year, we have a few different touch points throughout the year to make adjustments to the budget. The first one is our carryover review, which staff work on in July, and then we submit to the board for the board's decision in September. Our carryover review is, is really looking at what funding was left over from the prior year that was not spent by departments and trying to figure out usually one-time needs where that could be spent. Uh, we've often seen um, that funding put towards um, either capital projects or towards uh, environmental projects. Um, uh, we've also been dedicating some of that one-time funding towards affordable housing needs as well. Um, another touch point during the year that we've put in recently uh, since the pandemic is our mid-year review, um, where uh, as we've gotten to the pandemic, we, we realized, especially with um, the heavy influx of federal funds that we had, we needed another point in the year when the board could take action on the budget and adjust to meet those changing needs of the pandemic. Um, it's certainly a review that we're, uh, we're looking to sunset in the future um, because we, we think going forward, it's, it's not gonna be needed in our process, but that would typically happen uh, with board reviewing, where, sorry, the, the staff reviewing where we were in the October, November timeframe, the board taking action on that review in January. Uh, we also have our third quarter review, which is our last chance to make changes to the budget before the end of the year. Uh, that typically takes place in February, March for staff, and then uh, the board taking action on, on carryover, or sorry, on third quarter. Um, actually, uh, they, they just took action on our third quarter review two days ago um, on Tuesday. Meanwhile, throughout all of that, we are developing the next year's budget. Um, our process really starts uh, towards the end of summer when agencies submit their, um, their requests uh, for um, you know, what they would like to see as far as changes to their programs, um, where they see needs. Um, we review those, those requests. We work with the agencies to try to flesh out those requests, um, you know, try, try to uh, figure out exactly what levels of staffing or what levels of uh, funding they, they, they really need based on the proposal that they put out. Uh, we work with the county executive with our recommendations to then assemble what becomes his advertised budget plan. Um, that advertised budget plan is put out in February, and uh, that kicks off the, uh, the period when the, the board is, is really looking at that plan, um, asking questions about it, um, and uh, also soliciting feedback from the, uh, from the public. Um, the, the board during that time period has a number of town hall meetings uh, where they, they meet with citizens, try to get feedback. Um, we also have um, public hearings, which typically happen in mid-April, where um, residents are able to submit uh, testimony, either written uh, videos now, as well as appearing in person to, um, to discuss what they like or don't like about the budget and asking for changes to it. Um, then um, after those public hearings, we get into um, you know, where the board is actually making changes again uh, two days ago, where they they make those changes and eventually um, in May, May 10th this year is when they actually take formal action on the budget to adopt it. And then that budget going into effect in July. So moving to the next slide. Um, so one of the, um, the biggest constraints um, overall for our budget is that Virginia is a Dillon rule state. Um, and um, uh, Dillon being a, um, I believe he was actually a, a, a Supreme Court Justice of the Supreme Court of, I wanna say Kansas, uh, but he had this um, philosophy that um, a, a local government only has the powers given to it by the state because the states have original authority based on the founding of our nation as does our federal government. 
but that localities don't actually have um, authority in and of themselves. Um, some, uh, some states instead have um, home rule, where based on a, a city or county charter that you've essentially given authority to that city or county. Um, but here in Virginia, we operate under the Dillon rule, where really and truly Fairfax County only has those powers that are expressly granted by the state government. Um, and so, you know, when it comes around to um, either uh, enacting new programs, enacting new taxes, things like that, uh, the county can't do um, anything unless the state has actually told us that we can. And so um, where we see the, the, the biggest limitations for this are on our revenue side. Um, the Dillon rule significantly impacts the um, diversity of revenue sources that we have. Uh, the big one that I'd point out is that um, the county cannot put in an income tax. We know that um, as much as we all hate April and paying our federal income taxes, the income tax is actually um, a, a more um, fair, less regressive tax than a lot of other taxes. Um, there's also some, some benefits to be able to diversify tax as opposed to we are significantly reliant upon real estate taxes here because that is our, our really our, our only real source of revenue or our, our biggest lever that we have that the state has given us. Um, the state did take some action in 2020 to expand our taxing authority. Um, I think the big one coming in the future will be our ability to um, put in the meals tax, uh, but we do just have a, a few options available to us to diversify our tax space in the future. Uh, those being the meals tax, admission tax, as well as we have um, some rate flexibility in um, like cigarette tax and trans occupancy tax. But again, that Dillon rule, it really does restrict a lot of what the county can do. On the next slide, um, revenue structure. Um, as I was just talking, we are heavily reliant on the real estate tax. Uh, real estate taxes make up 68% of the county's budget. Um, when you add in personal property taxes, we get up to, uh, I believe it's better than 80% of our budget is there between property taxes, either personal property or real estate. Um, you know, this is where when we look at like our, our sister jurisdictions in Maryland, um, they're able to have a much more balanced approach of um, say a third, third, third between uh, property taxes, sales tax, and income tax, which um, gives them, um, you know, just just different methods that then um, uh, give them a little bit more, um, you know, less reliance on one, maybe a little bit more stability, uh, depending on what's happening in the market. Um, so uh, oh, a question about what is the admissions tax? Um, so that is something that we're not currently levying. We do have the authority. It, it wouldn't really raise too much in the way of money. Uh, but it is something that we've looked at. It's um, admission to um, like movie theaters, um, admission to um, also other venues. Um, it, it could impact if there were um, you know, arenas and things like that. Uh, depending on the ownership of them, it would impact those. Anywhere where really you're, you're buying a ticket to get into some place, it would impact that. Uh, there was some discussion about putting in the admissions tax um, a couple of years ago. But when the pandemic hit, and especially when it took a heavy toll on movie theaters, uh, there was a decision that it, it wasn't the right time to do that based on already the, the heavy economic toll that the pandemic had taken on those, um, on those businesses. Um, let's see here. So let's um, move on then to the next slide. Um, you know, so again, the, uh, the real estate tax is our largest source of revenue. Um, Looking at FY 2023, our um, mean assessed value or average assessed value of a residential home is currently $668,000, um, which increased over the 22 value by um, nearly 10%, about 9.6%. Um, and so going into our FY 23 budget, um, that was, uh, you know, one of the primary things we we're looking at was the, uh, the increase in the real estate tax bills, which um, in our advertised budget, we had held the tax rate at the current $1.14 tax rate. Um, had the board kept the tax rate at that rate, the average homeowner would have seen an increase of $666 in their tax bill. Um, I will say based on board action on Tuesday, um, we are expecting that they will uh, vote on May 10th to reduce that tax rate to $1.11. Um, and as a result, that, that impact on the average homeowner um, would decrease to $465. Um, but you can see here in the table, 
um, our, our changes in real estate values uh, year over year. Um, really, you know, again, the, the story this year is um, some of the dramatic increases in home values that we've seen. Um, you know, certainly the, the constrained inventory, the record low um, uh, interest rates that we had um, really contributed to those rising home prices. I saw a question pop up about how are the, um, the assessed values determined for houses. Um, we have our Department of Tax Administration, which has um, a, um, a, a whole group of um, professional assessors, uh, real estate appraisers, who um, go through a mass appraisal process. They have collected information on houses across the county, um, and that's held within their property record database. And then based on the sales that occur in each neighborhood, they use those sales to try to estimate what the market value of homes are in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, certainly they are trying to appraise the um, hundreds of thousands of houses as, as well as the commercial properties in the county um, every single year. And so it is, a, again, a mass appraisal process, highly reliant on um, computers in order to value an entire neighborhood at a time. But they are trying to base it on the actual sales there within the neighborhood. Um, and so the, uh, the change in assessed values then is, is primarily reflective of those changes in our actual sales prices based on appreciation of the home, based on you know, increases in what the house could be sold for. So then the other slide of the ledger on the, uh, the next slide, um, how those funds are spent. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, better than half, uh, about 52% of our budget goes to support the schools. Um, when you um, look uh, next on there, oh, um, uh, another question, sorry, about um, the assessments that Maryland revalues every th three years. What does Fairfax County do yearly? Um, I believe the answer to that is actually that we're required by state code. Um, I, I can't say that 100% completely, um, but I believe Virginia code does require that based on the size of locality that at some point you have to do it every single year. I believe we're at that point. Um, I know there's actually an argument as well as far as um, the, the if, you're, if you're doing it every three years, then you know, do you have um, bumps in those assessments all of a sudden? Uh, versus seeing that value picked up every year and maybe a more gradual change. Um, but I, I believe the answer does come down to, I think we are required by state code in order to do it every single year. Anyway, how our dollars are spent. As I said, more than half of our budget goes towards the public schools. Um, when we look at then just the county side of the ledger, um, the, uh, the largest couple of areas that the funding goes to are public safety. So our police, fire, sheriff, as well as our E911 system. Um, as well as our health and welfare. So our family services, um, our health department, uh, as well as neighborhood and community services. Um, and so um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, all told our general fund disbursements, including um, both the funds spent directly out of the, uh, the general fund, as well as uh, transfers out, such as our transfers to school, total $4.8 billion. Another area that my office works on is our capital improvement program on the next slide. Um, the capital improvement program is our plan uh, looking out into the next five as well as 10 years at uh, what needs there are with our county infrastructure. Um, you know, that county infrastructure is certainly including um, you know, county buildings like the one that I'm sitting in now, as well as our police and fire stations. Um, also, um, you know, looking at other things like our, um, our, our parks at the, uh, the, the trails and, and facilities that they have there. Um, looking as well at um, some of the um, like stormwater infrastructure, um, looking at um, some of the transportation projects that, that we do. Transportation is, is largely a state responsibility, but we as the county do identify needs where we need to make investments in um, our transfer, transportation infrastructure here in the county. Um, and so um, looking at that capital program, we address the capital program through a combination of um, what we call capital pay down, which would be funds identified during the course of the current year, as well as primarily with our bond program. Um, the bond program issuing debt in order to fund these, these facilities and then paying that debt off over the course of many years over the life cycle of that infrastructure. Um, our um, our county, county bond program, we are limited 
uh, based on our financial policies to um, selling $300 million in bonds every year. Um, 180 million of that is dedicated for schools infrastructure to their renovation cycle with their, their schools. Um, 120 million of that is allocated then to county programs. Um, I would note that uh, one of the things coming out of this year's budget cycle is looking at making um, changes to that bond sale limit. Um, actually, as part of their, their action on Tuesday, the board did approve that increase in the bond sale limit. Um, over the next few years, increasing at 300 million up to 400 million. Uh, we really hadn't increased that 300 million in, in quite a number of years. And so just keeping up with the cost of construction, um, really it's, it's harder to fit the, uh, the number of facilities that we need to into that number as the, uh, as the cost of construction has increased. So um, we'll be looking at an increase um, next fiscal year up to 350 million. Um, in that bond sale limit, and then uh, two years later, increasing that amount to 400 million. Uh, Mr. Green, is, is it a question on this slide? Yes, um, I had a question about um, the bond program and other uh, high priority initiatives. I've seen some of those decisions to either approve buying or selling bonds on voting ballots. And so I'm curious, what determines that um, a vote will come to the general public as opposed to being you know, decided by the board of directors or some other leadership within Fairfax County? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so there are um, a number of ways that a local government like ours could issue bonds. Um, you know, for one, um, they could be issued tied specifically to tax revenue where we're essentially pledging to whoever gives us the money, whoever buys the bond from us, that we will use that, that specific tax revenue to pay it back. Uh, that might be like um, if we had an improvement to um, one of the wastewater treatment plants, we might say that we're gonna use sewer fees to pay it back. Uh, that would be the kind of thing that the board could take action without going to the voters. When we go to the voters, it's for what's called general obligation bonds. Those are where we are pledging the, um, the, the, the full faith and credit of our local government to say we are going to pay those bonds back. That is saying that if we are on the, the brink of bankruptcy, that our first dollar is going to go to pay that, that debt back. And um, so when we're making those pledges, which is where this uh, 300, soon 350, and then $400 million bond limit applies, uh, whenever we're making those general obligation pledges, uh, that's where we need voter approval because we really are pledging that you know we as residents, as taxpaying residents, are are pledging to pay this this money back. So those are the ones that you're going to see out there on the ballot. Um, we do have um, a cycle where where we go through and you know we don't like to overwhelm voters when they're seeing that ballot, we don't like to make the ballot too terribly long because we want you to be able to make a decision on that. And so we do have a cycle where it's um, every other year, you'll see a schools bond question on there. And so the, uh, the school system, they have their own uh, capital program where they're looking at all their schools and they have their replacement cycle on schools, which I think it hover, hovers somewhere between 25 and 30 years that they're looking to renovate each school. And so they're, they're plotting that out to try to make sure they get to all those. And so you'll see those, um, I think those are in odd number of years. Um, and then uh, you'll typically only see uh, for the county side of the ledger in the even number of years. And even those, we're taking a look at each of our, our big program areas and only going out to voters uh, typically every six years uh, for things like looking at um, public safety, uh, you know, trying to, to schedule out when do we need to either renovate or replace, um, you know, police station, fire stations, as we see some of the, the changes. Um, I you know fire is one where um, both the changes in the workforce, our older facilities only had, um, had locker rooms for men. And so that's one of the changes we've needed to make over the years. Also um, apparatus, the, the fire trucks are bigger now. And so they, they don't fit in some of the old stations. Um, but, you know, just overall, the, the, the stations or any of our buildings, our libraries as well, you know, when they get to be, you know, 30 plus years old, at some point we need to renovate them. Um, but that'll be what you see. And so, you know, we do try to space those out. Um, whenever we do go out to, to referendum and get voter approval to sell those bonds, um, that starts an eight year clock when we can actually sell those bonds and then, um, you know, work through construction of those projects. 
Uh, so we do try to make sure that when we go out to voters and you know describe, yes, if you approve this bond, we are going to be renovating you know these libraries. We try to make sure that we get to those within a, a reasonable time frame, so you actually see the benefit of of what you voted on. To answer your question. Good. Um, all right. So um, moving on to the next slide. Um, yes, thank you. Okay, there we go. You froze a bit. All right. Um, so um, something that's very important when we're selling debt is our bond rating. Um, just like um, all of us as, the, as individuals, we know we have our credit score, which is very important if we are trying to you know, get a mortgage on a house. Uh, the county has its own credit score, which is its bond rating. Um, we try to make sure that we have, have very, very good financial policies in, the main, in order to maintain this credit rating. Uh, we have AAA uh, bond ratings from the um, three major credit rating bureaus, Moody's, Standards and Poor, and Fitch. And we've had those credit ratings um, since 1975, 1978, and 1997. Uh, we're one of only 49 counties in the country with that AAA bond rating from all three rating agencies. And um, this is extremely important in that it means that when we go out and we sell bonds, we're able to sell them for the um, absolute lowest interest rate available to jurisdictions like ours, which really saves us money over the long term when we're, we're making those infrastructure improvements. Um, on the next slide, talking about those financial policies, um, one of our primary uh, governing documents for our financial policies is our 10 principles of sound financial management. Um, that, that document was adopted in 1975. Uh, since then, the board has um, amended it as well as reaffirmed it a few times over the years. Um, one of the more recent times that it was amended was in 2016. Um, at that point, we had heard some feedback from those bond rating agencies that they were unhappy with our level of reserves that we had, uh, the amount of just cash that we had on hand in case of you know, economic issues and such. Um, at the time, we had 5% of our budget held in reserve. Um, and so based on their feedback, uh, the board amended those uh, 10 principles in order to increase that reserve level to 10%. And um, that, was, that was done in 2016. We were able to get to that 10% level uh, over the course of the next four years. And by FY 2020, we had met that 10% target. Um, it also establishes the limits on our um, borrowing, on how much, how much we can, we can uh, sell in bonds. Um, our debt service is limited to 10%. Of total disbursements, and then our net outstanding debt can't be more than three percent of the total assessed value of all property in the county. So we have some limits there on um, how much bonding we can have and how much our debt service can amount to. Um, and then um, this last bullet actually uh, not just recommended now, but as of uh, Tuesday, the board has again reaffirmed and amended the ten principles in order to increase our bond sale limit up to four hundred million dollars. Um, and so that'll be one of our new restrictions going forward, which gives us some more flexibility within that bond program um, in order to uh, make some more uh, progress on some of our um, infrastructure needs. On the next slide, um, actually, I just talked about this, um, that we have um, increased our reserves uh, from 5% up to 10%. Um, I see a question in the chat. How is the 1% for bond rating invested. Um, can we flip back to the, just see if I, if um, Patricia, if you want to speak up, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question on the 1%. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Once um, you have to retain or not use 10% of the budget to maintain that bond rating. What do you do with that money? Okay, so um, so I, I should say this is um, our overall budget, the the kind of recurring money we're bringing in each year in revenue and then spending. Um, it's not that we're like holding 10%, we're holding a, an amount equal to that, just in cash. And so that is invested um, in, you know, to in order to earn interest, uh, we have limits on what we can invest in, um, but that, that 10% is um, you know it's not that 10% of your taxes each year are put towards that. It's that we have identified it was usually one-time funding that was left over at the end of the year. 
that we could put into these reserve accounts and say, here's the money we've set aside. Um, but it is primarily just held there. Um, we have we have three reserves that make up that 10%. Um, one is our managed reserve. Um, another is our revenue stabilization reserve. We have rules regarding when those can be tapped into, which is not very often at all. I don't think we've ever tapped into the managed reserve. We tapped into the revenue stabilization reserve once during the entire course that we've had it, which is over 20 years now. Uh, those are nine of the 10%. Um, the other 1% is our economic opportunity reserve, um, which is something that was established for one to, to make the bond rating agencies a little happier, but also it is um, that 1% identified as funding that if the board identified an opportunity to um, improve the, account, the, the county by acting on some opportunity very quickly, uh, then they would have that funding as a possible source to go to. We would then have to replenish that money fairly quickly, um, but it's been out there. Uh, since that went into effect a few years ago, um, the board has primarily identified some, some small projects that look to invest in the economy in the, the county to where replacing those funds hasn't really been too much of as far as a hit um, as we've gone forward. All right, um, so let's move on to um, the next slide then. Um, and so now we're shifting to talk about the current year budget. I know I've touched on this a little bit, um, but the, uh, the current year budget the county executive proposed uh, focused um, primarily on our recruitment and retention challenges. Um, you know, I, I know we've all heard about the great resignation. I know um, private sector um, as well as the county have all experienced difficulties um, retaining um, employees as well as recruiting new employees. Uh, with the county, um, we've, we've primarily frozen pay over the course of the past couple of years. We did have a 1% one, one across the board at some point, but um, we certainly have seen challenges um, in a number of areas. Um, some of our health professionals, um, certainly within our police department as well, uh, being able to retain employees, um, being able to recruit new employees. And so, um, you know, one of the, the big investments here is into employee compensation. Um, the, uh, the budget also um, kind of integrates with some of the stimulus funding that we've, we've received recently. Um, so we've, um, we've received federal stimulus in, in a number of tranches, and we stood up some, some programs over the past couple of years, um, one of them being um, expanding our school health program in order to get a nurse in every school. And so part of this advertised budget is getting baseline funding in then to supplant some of that one-time funding that we can't rely on going forward for some of these recurring programs. Um, it also um, has significant increases in our real estate and personal property taxes based on rising values, um, particularly if you've seen your, um, your, your car tax assessments. I, I forget if those have gone out at this point, but um, one of the weird things we saw this year is you typically expect used cars to depreciate in value each year. Um, but with all the supply chain disruptions that we've had, um, especially the, the difficulty manufacturing some of those electronic components that go into cars, um, you know, you know it's, it's tough buying a new car, and as a result, used car values have actually appreciated. People were actually able to sell cars for more this year than they bought them for last year. Um, and so um, that, that, that's been a significant impact on the budget this year. Um, part of the board's action, I mentioned before that they've reduced, they've, they've indicated they're going to reduce the tax rate by three cents. Um, they also took some action to um, reduce car assessments to where, you know, based on this significant increase, um, they're actually lowering car assessments by 15% um, down from um, what, um, so DTA for car assessments uses the JD power um, estimates of what cars are worth. The board has to decided that they're going to reduce those values by 15% just to try to mitigate that impact on um, homeowners. Um, and then again, aligning our um, adjustments with the strategic plan that Lori talked about earlier. So um, the next slide um, highlights of the budget. Um, so the advertised budget was built on that $1.14. Um, with that $1.14, we had left the board $80 million in balance to consider. Um, we had also, during the course of our budget process, um, revised our revenue estimates, um, the, the big one being um, some, of the, some increase in personal property taxes as well as uh, transient occupancy. Hotel taxes had started to rebound and identified $16 million extra. And so the board had $96 million to work with going into their, their budget deliberations. They used the lion's share of that 
to reduce the tax rate by that three cents. Um, the, uh, the rest of that funding, um, they uh, were able to identify some additional uh, funding for um, uh, pay for our public safety employees. Um, the budget also fully funded the school's operating request. I would say as the board worked through um, the budget and working with the school board uh, and based on what they anticipate the state to do uh, in support for the schools, um, they were able to identify $10 million that they could shift out of that operating request and into our affordable housing program. Uh, so that's another one of the changes that we'd expect them to vote on um, in a few weeks. It fully funded our, comp our county compensation program I'd also invested in a number of board priorities like our affordable housing program, uh, our diversion first, our opioid um, prevention program, um, some increases in public safety staffing as we're looking to um, finish opening up our, our, um, our Scotts Run fire station. And um, then also, let's see here, what else? Um, baseline funding for some of those um, programs that we initially funded with stimulus funding, such as our co-responder program which looks to make sure that we get the right people out when we have an emergency call from someone in crisis, um, also those school health nurse programs. And then it also begins to make some investments based on the recommendations of our CIP committee, uh, putting $5 million more towards capital pay down each year. Um, the next slide. And uh, there was a question, any investment to um, e-cars, so um, uh, electric vehicles. Um, the, the board has, um, as one of their policy goals, put out a timeline where they would like to see the county fleet transition to electric vehicles. Um, and so that is out there. The board had put in some funding. Um, One-time funding is part of our carrier review towards that purpose. We had some additional funding actually as part of our third quarter review, which was also just approved on Tuesday to look at um, funding some of that increased cost due to electric vehicles. Um, so this slide really gets at the, uh, the heart of that advertised budget, uh, showing where the money comes from, where it goes. Um, so uh, to, to try to speed through it, um, some of the big adjustments on the revenue side, uh, we had originally put $5 million uh, towards our affordable housing program, in addition to the existing half penny that we have towards that program. Again, as part of board action, they identified an additional $10 million towards that program. And so the board um, is now set to restore what was previously um, going back a number of years in the budget, which is a full penny on the tax rate going to affordable housing. Um, on the disbursement side, um, over $100 million towards county uh, pay and benefits for our employees. Uh, funding debt service, both for county and schools. Um, then in that lifelong education and learning section, uh, the bulk of that going towards schools, um, 102, um, after that $10 million increase, about $102 million increase um, in the school's operating transfer. Then uh, going through our strategic plan priority areas where the investments are um, first uh, within the um, health area, uh, $15 million in investments there, which includes some investments in our Diversion First program, uh, also baseline funding for those school health nurse positions. Um, in mobility and transportation, that $12 million primarily reflects our um, operating support for the metro system, as well as some support for our connector bus fleet. Um, effective and efficient government, the $12 million there includes um, support for our elections uh, department, as well as support for technology infrastructure. Um, it also includes some funding and positions for our new language access program, which is trying to make um, translation services uh, more accessible to more of our county agencies, really in order to make more of our documents available and more accessible to the community. Uh, we have over $10 million included in the empowerment support for residents facing vulnerability area. Um, that includes some investments in our consolidated community funding pool, um, it also includes the baseline funding for that co-responder program that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then the uh, over $6 million in safety and security uh, primarily includes um, that additional staffing for the Scotts Run Fire Station. Uh, when we first opened that station, we were only able to put a, um, I believe it was a medic unit there. And so this would be staffing then the fire engine there as well. 
Um, we also have within that area um, some um, new positions in order to begin staffing the, um, the South County Animal Shelter as well. And then um, we have over, almost $5 million in support for cultural and recreational opportunities that was included in the advertised budget. Um, that primarily included um, new facilities like Patriot Park North, the Lorton and Sully Community Centers. Um, it also includes a pilot equity program within the Park Authority, uh, which would be a, a $500,000 program in order to uh, begin trying to make some of those parks programs um, more accessible throughout um, the, the county. Um, also, as part of our board, the board adjustments, the board did direct an additional $750,000 towards parks in order to um, support their uh, natural, natural resource sustainability efforts. Um, and so then our remaining categories here, they include investments in school-age childcare rooms, positions to support our affordable housing program, and then um, some other adjustments. And so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, and so this um, actually, um, some of the things on this slide based on the timing of where we are on the budget process have, have kind of passed us by, um, but um, let's uh, go ahead and flip to the next one then. So um, our budget process, um, you know, again, we're at the tail end of it, uh, but the ways that we have to, to provide input, if you'd like to get involved, especially looking ahead to when we're building the FY 2024 budget, which would be next spring, um, you know, we certainly have town halls that the, uh, the supervisors hold throughout their districts. Um, then we also have um, various ways to submit testimony as well as feedback, um, which are detailed here. I might also note that our budget website there at the bottom has some fantastic resources regarding the budget. And then I think our last slide is just our budget timeline. And so again, as you look at our timeline, um, we're nearing the end of our process. I think I touched on a lot of these dates, um, but you know, really what we have left coming up is on May 10th will be when the board actually adopts the budget. Um, from there, the school board has a few more weeks as they work on their budget, especially trying to incorporate what the, what the state does. And then we'll be looking towards the budget year beginning on July 1st. So um, that's the end of my slides. I'm sorry for going a little bit long there, um, but if there are any other questions aside from the ones that came up during the course, I don't know if there's any in the chat that I didn't address. Hey, Phil, yeah, it was um, one question um, early on. Um, I'll read it. Um, when you sell a house in Fairfax County, the seller pays a fee or tax to Metro. Is this something that Fairfax County authorized? Does this money go to the county and then to Metro or directly to Metro? Um, so there are a number of taxes um, that the, um, the state authorized to support transportation a few years ago. Um, those taxes, I believe they primarily go into one of those um, those uh, separate funds that we have, and then they are dedicated to um, some of those transportation projects. And so they're dedicated either to um, Metro or in some cases, some of those special taxes are dedicated to um, expansion of existing transportation facilities. And so it could be uh, like new connector bus routes and things like that. Um, a lot of those taxes really are though intended to expand service. Thank you. And there was another question just put in the chat. Um, have funds been diverted from other programs involving addiction to go towards opiates? Are their insurance companies doing their part? Um, so um, we have stood up, and it, it's been going for a few years now, our, um, our opioid prevention task force, which is um, you know, a joint effort between a few different agencies in order to try to get a grip on the, um, the opioid epidemic that we're facing. Um, and, and so there are some significant efforts across the board in order to try to make a dent in that. Um, when that's been stood up, it's um, primarily been with, with new funding that was identified um, over the course of several years now. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for answering the chat. Appreciate it. Um, I see there's one more question that just came up. Do revenues generated in this section of Fairfax County pay for expenditures uh, in this section of Fairfax County? 
Um, so the, um, I, I mean, the, the, the simple answer would be that the uh, revenues are not geographically isolated like that. Um, you know, when, when we are looking at the budget, we're looking at the budget as a whole. Um, you know, we're certainly looking to make sure that we are providing services across the county. Um, you know, it, but um, it would be tax revenues across the county that are supporting then uh, police services across the county that are supporting fire services across the county that are prefer, pr uh, providing, you know, parks um, and libraries and such across the county. So, um, you know, I, I would say that we do try to make sure that we are, um, you know, each department meeting the needs of the community as a whole and trying to make sure that we do have those services in various parts of the county. All right, thank you. Oliver, you have your hand raised, go ahead. Sorry, so um, I was asking, uh, according to the, to the budget that was proposed, the budget is not until May 10th, that's when that everyone's going to vote on it. I mean, I thought it was like nine. It was like nine to one as far as the budget is concerned. Like everyone was voting on it. So, um, so yeah. So, so we're in the midst of um, our process where it's what happened two days ago. Is uh, I know my whole office kind of breathed a sigh of relief because um, that's where a lot of the the real work happens. Where they did vote nine to one to. Um, essentially set the package as they intend the package to be. That was budget markup. Um, and so now we're in this like two week period where my office has time in order to actually prepare the like official documents that the board actually needs to vote on uh, in order to you know set tax rates, in order to approve the resolutions that give the county the authority to spend money, things like that. And that's really the formal adoption of the budget. And that's gonna be on May 10th. Um, so at this point, the expectation would be that we're going to have another nine to one vote on May 10th. Yeah. Um, but really most of the work was done this past Tuesday. And, um, while it's, I would say technically possible that the board could make some other change to the budget, they don't. And so what they approved on Tuesday, the kind of those changes that I outlined is what's going to be in the budget when they approve it. And again, I expect a nine to one vote on, um, May 10th on it, just the same. So. It's, it's that kind of weird period where it's not formally adopted yet, but it, it kind of is, so. All right, thanks, Phil. Thanks, Oliver, for that question. In the interest of time, um, I know it's so hard because it's so much you know, wonderful information that um, we're getting privy to um, and be able to have up close and um, personal conversations with those who work directly with um, these particular agencies that give us this wonderful information. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, if you will, um, please um, put your uh, questions in the chat, um, as well as don't forget, you will be getting these presentations along with the information of each presenter. So that way you can reach out to them directly if you choose to, um, to be able to connect and, and continue this um, awesome dialogue. Uh, but I wanna tra transition us on uh, to the next in the interest of time, uh, just to make sure we don't keep you all to 10 o'clock. So I know we let you all out early last week, um, but I, I, we don't want to spoil you again um, because we want to make sure we get all the information in. So, um, Phil, someone says, can you, um, Larry Green would like to connect with you as well to share your email address. Um, so you can put that in the chat. Um, and for those of you who will check your email um, tomorrow, I will be sending out the presentations, which will be included, um, which will be, uh, which will include the information. But yeah, Phil, if you can put your information in the chat, that would be great. Uh, wonderful. Thank you all so very much. Wonderful questions and, and great dialogue. Uh, at this time, I do uh, want us to make sure, uh, want to make sure that we do have time for um, our community uh, engagement um, presentation on asset mapping, because it's really critical. I think what was said earlier in regards to, you know, how do we get the community more involved and how do we know um, what people bring to our community or our organization or our leadership group or our um, civic group or HOA group, right? So there's opportunities where uh, we want to be able to connect you with some valuable uh, best practices as well as to use uh, within your um, within your community as a resident or a, a member, uh, a leadership um, opportunity. So uh, Paul Woods is going to come on uh, now and give us um, a briefing on asset mapping 
And again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. You'll get a copy of the presentation as well. And you'll be able to um, reach out to myself as a member of the community developer team to answer any further questions that you will have at the end of the presentation. And then we wanna ensure we have time for our, uh, our practicum check-in uh, just to make sure we touch base with um, those who may have questions or need uh, feedback on uh, their suggested uh, practicum uh, uh, presentation. So uh, with that, Paul, are you ready? I am ready. All right, take it away. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Woods and I am a community developer with uh, Neighborhood and Community Services. And today I am going to discuss um, asset mapping. So I'm gonna ask you to, yep, go to the next page. All right, so in this presentation, we're gonna talk about what is a community asset, you know, what is asset mapping and importance of it, some examples of community assets and you know how to map assets in a community, either through an asset, an asset map or tools or methods. So before I go on, um, I'd like to know if you can um, share with me in the chat uh, what you consider to be a community asset. Share in the chat what you consider to be a community asset. Let's see what I see here. Historical building in the community, food resources. Okay. Anything else? I see knowledgeable resources. I see police presence, education, parks and center. Okay. Otis, you now we rolling. Brian, okay. All right. Um, is that it? I see a few. After school program, libraries and rec centers. Okay. After school programs. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Um, that's a few. Um, so there was one thing on here that I did not see, um, nursing and adult care centers. All right, there's one thing that was very important that I did not see on here. And so we're gonna discuss that, but let's move forward to the next page, please. And so this is what the definition is from us. Um, a community asset is anything that improves the quality of your of community life. So that would include the skills and ability of community members. Um, I heard somebody say a physical structure or place. I heard some of those libraries, parks. I heard, I did see, did I see local businesses, citizen associations or councils? We saw some of those. Local, private, public, and nonprofit institutions or organizations. You know, these are some examples of what we would consider to be a community asset. However, you know, one of the most important things that, you know, in my opinion, as a community developer is the actual skills of an individual or a person. Um, and so even with the question that was asked this morning, um, when we asked you about um, the importance of engaging in terms of your community, I didn't hear anybody say how, their, how valuable their input was or them being a community member and how beneficial that you are, what your skills and abilities are for us in terms of county government to help provide you with services. Um, it seemed like everybody was asking, what are the services, where can we find them? But I think a lot of times people don't even look to see what they already have. And many of you know about these services because you're in the community. Um, I heard somebody say she volunteers with Teresa. You volunteer and you drive seniors around. You, you are, you. I would consider you to be a community asset. Um, I hear some other people who are part of members of organizations. Y'all are considered community assets. So I would say, don't say yourself cheap. Well, not cheap, but don't minimize your value because I believe that you are um, community assets. And so. Um, if I need to at this time, you know, I've, I'm a, a follow Western movies and, you know, they always have in these Westerns, the sheriff will deputize 
you know, some of these folks in the community because there's a gang of um, unruly people that are coming and he needs help. So, you know, what I would do or what I would say is that, um, you know, as a, a community developer for uh, neighborhood and community services, you know, I am going to officially recognize you as a community asset. So I'm going to need your help to, to help us and help your community to continue to, to strive and progress. So as of um, what we got here, today is April the 28th. I'm going to recognize you as official community assets. And so you're going to be able to help us and, and as we move forward. Okay, and after you hear all these great institutions and different things, how you can help us, then you'll look at yourself in that way. Next page, please. So the definition of asset mapping, what is asset mapping? So this is an actual tool that you can use as a process. Right now, what we're gonna be doing is just giving you some formal things uh, that you can use to help you but anybody can use uh, these different tools however you feel best. Uh, so the process of cataloging the resources of the community, it provides information about the strengths and resources and can help uncover solutions. It helps to think more easily about how to build on these assets to address community needs and improve health. Asset mapping promotes community involvement, ownership and empowerment. Um, and which I feel that, again, um, you, many people just identified, you know, some types of assets with, uh, that are within their community, including the, the skills and abilities that they have. So what's the importance of uh, asset mapping? It creates awareness of local resources. Uh, you can use resources and health improvement activities, and you can recognize and, and value the gifts within a community. Um, and I think people do asset mapping on a regular basis. If I ask you where the best restaurant was, even though that may not be necessarily resources, you could tell me where the restaurants are to go in your community. You could tell me where you can get the best deal on clothes or maybe things like that. We all do a certain sense of resource, of asset mapping, you know, depending upon what it needs, needs are for us. If it's something for your children, if it's a nursery, programs, daycare programs, you know, and we do them on a regular basis, but this is uh, giving you an, an official uh, definition, and we're going to also give you some other tools. So next. So here's some examples. Uh, we talked about local residents, um, their skills, their experiences, their passions, capacities, but we also want to pay, uh, pay a special attention uh, to the residents who are sometimes marginalized, who may not have a voice, who are underserved. You know, when I looked at your, your map earlier, I saw a big and big print underserved communities. So again, um, you know, what we're hoping that everybody in this group here will, will take, won't take for granted is the marginalized people who can have value and have, can be considered and looked at as a community asset. Uh, so next, we have local uh, voluntary associations, clubs, and, and networks. You know, many of you did mention some of those. You talked about faith-based organizations. Um, so we do know about that. Local institutions, another example, you have mentioned that, parks, police stations, local businesses, we mentioned that. Our physical assets, the land, um, buildings, you know, maybe potentially if an organization or individual doesn't have space to have a meeting, you can meet with somebody who has maybe a space in a building that can provide you with an area where you can have a meeting or host a meeting uh, to discuss things. And then also uh, economic access, um, what people produce and consume, businesses, informal economic exchanges, broader relationships. So these are some of the things of examples of community assets. And another thing was y'all mentioned how diverse your community are. And so, and so there are some other ways that you can definitely barter and also get other, um, because of the diversity, it can enrich in what type of assets you have because it'd be very diverse what you provide. Uh, next, please. 
So, you know, one of the things that I, we wanted to share with you is that this is now a, a template on how to do um, a community um, asset mapping. However, we have two diagrams. Now, on your left is the, the diagram that used to be used back in the 70s. This is really old school, how the federal government and even some city municipalities will look at a community, they will look at it at a deficit. They will look at it as potentially maybe looking at it at the glass half full, you know, slum housing, crime, teenage pregnancy, gangs. Um, we, they will look at it at the, the negative things about it. What we're asking you to do is to see how um, the assets and community are positive things. You know, we're looking at the people in a positive way. We're looking at how we can utilize some of the space uh, and use and, and, and use people's skill sets and and engage and partner with other organizations that to, can help improve the community as opposed to looking at it as a deficit community, which was an approach that was really used in the 70s, 80s, but today, um, and maybe even now, but today, as you'll hear later on, um, you know, Fairfax County is looking at another way to engage the community and so that we can get your input, get your feedback, get you, use you as a resource and to help county government and, and communities just thrive and do things together. All right, so uh, next, uh, how am I doing on time? 820. So what I wanna do, um, I'm sorry, let me just go back to that last page again. I know I said next, but on this, on the right side of the screen, um, so it's, it's this is actually a template. So it's allowing you to see the steps. Again, um, each community or each individual or each organization can use these steps based on what your needs are and how you feel is, is best. Um, so you can look at a specific population, define your community first. What is the population that you wanna identify to actually then asset map it or map it out? Uh, determine what you want to do with this information collected. You know, again, I have to go back to Risa. If you work with seniors, then that could be something that as a group, or you may just do it on your own, you're taking seniors to different locations. So then you'll begin to develop some type of idea of where some of the seniors can go and resources that they can, that they can use. And just informally, um, you'll map it, but then you could have these resources on, your, on the tip of your tongue and share them with these seniors as they're in your car while you're transporting them. Um, identify of involved partners, um, right? Uh, I see also cultural stories and histories are ha assets as well. Um, I did notice a few names. I saw Palmore, I saw Graves. Many of these families have been in this community for many years and they have some historical background and also cultural backgrounds for some of the communities that you live. So even in terms of that, those are um, individuals that have cultural and historical backgrounds. I don't know about some of the others, but there, I'm sure there are other families here that know about the, the historical conditions uh, that happened in your community. Those are assets. Um, and right here, when we say identify and involve partners, that's other organizations, you know, if it is a community organization that really works with a certain population, it could be the, the Latin or Hispanic community, it could be the Asian community. Um, that's where you can involve partners and, and get information and, and find out about different assets that can help uh, some of those uh, minority populations because you have a diverse community. Um, you know, then you select what assets you want to identify, you know, specifically for what it is that you want to um, uh, find information out because you'll notice there's just a lot of information out there, but you want to be able to focus it. Identify any previous asset mapping activities. Maybe some other organizations have done it. Um, maybe Neighborhood and Community Services has done it. Maybe a faith-based organization has done it. Uh, next. All right, so then we're asking you to develop a plan uh, to collect the information. Um, you want to map the assets um, of the community for individuals, associations, institutions, and, then, and identify community issues and then reevaluate your process. You know, what are some of the things you did well? 
what would you like to improve on the next time did you actually reach your target population um so again on the left side is just a map how you'll see in the middle is community assets but they touch every aspect within the community where it could be around education it could be around cultural wellness for health um so a variety of things so community assets is very important um and it starts with you. It starts where the people are, um, and and everybody can do their part because it's it's not just one way. It's a holistic approach and how you can look at at that. Um, I'm gonna turn to the next place, please. All right. So these are some technology. You know, everybody talks about technology. These are some examples uh, within our agency. Uh, we have. Um, online, you can access the Fairfax County Human Service Resource Guide. You can type in information about a particular uh, population or, or agency or different topic, and you can get uh, a listing of different assets or different programs that can help you with those issues. In addition to that, again, Google Maps, you know, you could just put in, you know, uh, resources around transportation options and put it in Google Maps and then it will bring up certain things within your area. And so this is a way how technology can be used as a tool to assist you when you're doing uh, asset mapping. Next. Okay, so now these are specific processes that you can use. Um, you could do community engagement, engage mapping. So that's when you have a group of people working specifically, y'all sit down and say, let's, we want to do an asset map of this particular service for this community or this, this group. And y'all get together, sit down, and y'all just put it all out there together. You could do interviews as more like focus groups. You can go to a, maybe a faith-based organization. You can go to a, uh, maybe a store and do interviews of people as they're coming in and out or and then get a, an idea of what type of assets in the community. You know, surveys, everybody does, uh, there's a variety of ways to do surveys. You can send them out by email online to your group or do them hand by, by I guess, traditionally do them on paper. And then community walks. Um, there may be some people on here that have done community walks before. You just walk in the community. It's a great, great way to get to know your neighbors, get, pe get to know people in the community. You know, when you do these community walks, they, they get to identify a face. And then you may also, even though you're looking for maybe specific assets, but you can find out, you know, what their interests are. And then you, I heard somebody say to a young gentleman said, well, you know, how do we get the information about the county and get it to our, the people who are generally underserved? Well, this is how you can do it, do community walks you know, with the fraternity, with a sorority, with a faith-based organization, this gives you that one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of um, interaction that helps you connect people to the county or other resources. Next, please. All right, so this is just a, a summary. Um, and we just wanna emphasize that communities do have a lot of access to capitalize on as an individual, as an associ associ association, association, institutional, economic. Um, asset mapping then goes beyond maps and the highlights needs. Is, again, this is a tool that you can use. It helps to be, be, begin conversations. Um, and, and it works with what's here in the community instead of what doesn't work and what's, and, and what's missing. Like we said, that was a deficit map. You want to work on and build on what you have already. Um, so um, that's that's kind of it. These are the different um, uh, reasons why this can be helpful for you and uh, uh, share some techniques. And then, you know, the last thing will be if you do the actual mapping and we'll send you a copy of one, you know, it also is a visual representation of community knowledge so people can actually see it. Um, as if you were looking on a Google map or something like that, so. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate you for going over very quickly about asset mapping. Um, if anyone does have any questions, um, please put them in the chat as this is being recorded. We can go back and then we can look at the questions and be able to direct them 
uh, to the appropriate person, as well as answer any questions. Um, being that I'm a community developer as well, I'll be happy, um, be happy uh, to uh, to continue the conversation about asset mapping to give you more insight and an opportunity to um, dive in it to a little bit deeper, depending on what you're trying to do. So I'll be happy to talk with you on one on one or in a group. So just let me know. Um, I do appreciate all of the presenters tonight. I know we, we talked about having a practicum check in for those of you who would like to stay on in the interest of time because it is 829. Um, and like Latishma said, we want to be a respecter of, uh, of, of your time. If you have any um, thing that you would like to talk about in regards to your practicum, I ask if you don't mind, stay on at least five more minutes. Uh, for those of you um, who, who may um, want to talk with um, our practicum expert, Ms. Jennifer Henry Jones, she's gonna come on right now. Um, and if you have questions, we're gonna take you off mute uh, to be able to answer your question or you can put it in the chat. Uh, so please do so at this time. Jennifer, are you still on? I am here. Um, I, in particular, I wanted to check in with the folks um, who are new this evening. Last week, we talked about the practicum, which is really a um, field exercise for you to apply everything that you learn over the next six weeks um, at, to either a an issue that's taking place in your community that you want to tackle, or you can take the route of um, going through an experience where you could attend a community a meeting, like a board of supervisors meeting, a budget meeting. Um, you could interview someone at a, HO, at a um, community based organization that you have interest in. Or like I said, you could apply it to um, an issue that's taking place in your community. Um, whichever route you do take, you can don't have to do this um, by yourself. You can work in a group of up to five people or you can work solo. Um, we just ask that by, um, is it next week, Katina, that we want people to it's tell actually, you? It's or actually tonight? tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, okay. <laughs> so we can start okay. next week with the groups and putting people together and then being able to network and um, share information. Okay, so if you know um, who you would like to work with if, and what your topic is, if you could get that to Katina um, by tomorrow, so that way we can identify if there are any duplications, then we can help you to find um, another topic. We just ask that people um, experience something new, so don't go to an organization that you're familiar with or um, a topic that you have already worked on. We want this to be a new experience for everyone. Um, what we ask is that on the last evening of class, you present to the class what you have learned in a five to seven minute presentation. And you can be as creative as you want. You can just get up and talk. Well, actually we're not getting up. Oh wait, we're gonna be in person, aren't we? Yeah, we're trying to make the last one in person for the for our celebration. <laughs> yeah, so you can um, do a PowerPoint presentation or you can just get up and, you know, share your thoughts with the class or you can get super creative. Um, and Katina and myself, Paul and Nandred, we're all here to um, help you, to help um, connect you to resources um, or help answer any questions that you need. So I'm here, Katina's here, Paul's here. If you need um, to discuss it further, if you're one of the um, new students, I'm happy to stay on and talk to you about it some more. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and I, I will be sending out again um, the practicum overview as well as the fill-in sheet. Like I said earlier, the fillable form, it is fillable electronically. Um, so that way you can uh, fill it out on your device. If you are having any difficulties, you can just tell me which number uh, that you want to do. So that way I can try to match people up based upon um, their, um, their request. Um, so that way it could be um, a group effort, which, which helps each other out as well. I see Otis, you have your hand raised, go ahead. Yes, uh, I am looking to, um, I'm looking to do a topic somewhere around the citizen's view of social justice in the Fairfax County Police Department. And uh, I wonder if I may be able to get an interview with some significant officer that could assist me um, in an interview, maybe the police chief or whatever, uh, 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 at some point in time over the next few weeks. Or is that something not doable? 
We can um, definitely help with that. Um, I'll probably need some help from Katina if you'd like to interview someone down in the um, Mount Vernon area, but we can definitely help connect you to someone in the police department. Thank you. Kathy, did you have a question? I do have a question. I know the last week you talked about how um, Braddock District has also done this. Um, and you said that they had some presentations that were really awesome. Is there any way we could hear like the topics of what they did or do you want us just to just be organic? And do we ever get to see what they did? I'm really curious now you've got me all excited about it. Um, Paul, do you have any, because Paul was the one, the facilitator for Braddock District. So Paul, do you have any of those presentations available that you could share um, with Katina so she could send them out? Um, I can speak with some of the participants to see if that's something that they're willing to share. Um, so I can I can look into that. However, you know, many of the topics were from the list that uh, Katina has presented to them, and I can say it was that they were done a variety of ways. Some did PowerPoint presentations. Some did basic. Well, yes, they did a variety of different ways. Thanks, Paul. I see there's another uh, question. Okay, Teresa says she's looking at number 13, Area Agency on Aging, if anyone is interested. Um, also see that um, Dave Simon said he's looking at uh, area number 18, if anyone wants to partner. So feel free to use the chat, you guys, to just connect. Um, you can send each other the private message um, as well. But when you send those forms to me, I'm definitely going to look to see um, what numbers you guys have chosen so I can just try to connect you if you're willing to be able to partner. Uh, Oliver, go ahead, you have your hand raised. I think you just answered the question just now. Um, I was gonna ask if you could just have a list of everybody's uh, field, but I, I haven't even seen the details or what areas that we can, we can capture. So we had like a, just a format or a list of everybody's names and emails. That way we can communicate if we want to work with each other on a certain projects or whatnot. Sure. What what we have um, through this platform, we've asked um, just for, for privacy and um, confidentiality because some people may not feel comfortable. Um, we just ask mm -hmm. that if it's something of interest to you, then I will be able to then speak to the other participant to see if they're willing to be able to partner. All right, that's perfect. Okay, yeah. So, and I, I'll send you that. I know you just joined um, on recently, so I'll make sure I'll, I'll send that to you um, tomorrow as well uh, in regards to the practicum overview and everything. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for that question, though. Um, all right. And then Kathy's looking to join with Shirley, possibly, um, in regards to um, a practicum. So that's wonderful. So this is this is great. This is the, the start of the conversation. So um, again, we can talk offline, it's no pressure, no worries, uh, but we just wanted the opportunity to check in. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for being able uh, to stay on with us for a couple of extra minutes um, because it is um, now going 837. Um, yep. Patricia said she's interested in recycling and if anyone interested in joining the efforts, um, again, just put it in the chat. I'll go back to it or you can send me an email um, just to ensure that we are staying in communication um, in, in regards to your request. Um, and Letitia, you want to wrap us up? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Tori, can you take down the PowerPoint? So thank you, everyone. Thank you to Lori. Thank you to Phil. Thank you for you, the residents, to stay on at 837. So without further ado, because again, we want to honor folks' time. Oh, I think I started here myself. Echo. I just want to say thank you. We'll see you next Thursday. And have a wonderful weekend. Oh, it is it is Friday's Eve. I'm sorry. Have a wonderful <laughs> <laughs> evening. Happy Friday tomorrow. And we will Happy see you Friday next Thursday. Happy Friday tomorrow. Yes, yes. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Enjoy Thank the rest you, guys. Of your night. Enjoy the rest of your yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you can tell I wanted to be Thank you so much. Thank it was you. wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye, Monday. Bye, 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 everyone. So have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye. <laughs> Hi. And we can stop the recording. Yes, ma'am. Bye, Miss Moman.
<laughs> I gotta say, I, 